Hello, my name is Boris Kutza. I'm a PhD student at the University of Manchester. And today I will talk about counting polynomial configurations in subsets of finite fields. This topic comes from the area of additive combinatorics. So let me start by giving you a short introduction about the area. Additive combinatorics studies arithmetic structures in subsets of natural numbers, finite fields, function fields, etc. Examples of arithmetic structures that we study include, for instance, arithmetic progressions, polynomial progressions, or solutions to linear equations. Today, I will focus on polynomial progressions, by which I mean a configuration of, of the form x, x plus p1y up to x plus pmy, where p1 through pm are distinct polynomials with integer coefficients and zero constant terms. So let us look at some examples of this. The first example is an arithmetic progression. What you can see here is an m-term arithmetic progression. Another example could be a so-called geometric progression shifted by x. And let me point out that these two examples are, in a sense, two extremes. Arithmetic progressions satisfy a lot of algebraic relations, whereas the terms of geometric progressions are linearly independent. In between these two extremes, we have a lot of other examples, and here you can see some of them. The central theorem in additive combinatorics is the Samoretti theorem proved 45 years ago. It says the following. Let A be a dense subset of natural numbers, and let's suppose that M is a natural number greater than or equal to three. Then, a contains a non-trivial arithmetic progression of length m, by which I mean the following configuration, and non-trivial means that the difference y is non-zero. Let me here recall what dense means. A subset of natural numbers if den is dense if it occupies a positive proportion of natural numbers. What this means is that the following limb soup is positive. Otherwise, we call the subsets of natural numbers sparse. And for instance, the set of even numbers is dense with density one over two, because roughly every other natural number is even. By contrast, the set of primes will be sparse. From prime number theorem, we know that there are roughly n over log n primes between the one and n. Hence, the proportion of primes in the interval from one to n is roughly one over log n. And this quantity converges to zero as n goes to infinity. Therefore, primes form a sparse set. Today, I will mostly focus on the polynomial generalization of Samaritan theorem, proved by Bergons and Lampmann 24 years ago. Um, let p1 through pm be distinct integral polynomials. By integral, I mean that they take integer coefficients and also that they have zero constant terms. Then, each dense subset of natural numbers contains a polynomial progression of the following form. And again, this progression will be non-trivial, meaning that the value of y here is non-zero. This is a generalization of Samaritan theorem because Samaritan theorem stated the same thing, but only for arithmetic progressions. Here we know it for more general polynomial progressions. Let me also point out that this criterion that polynomials have zero constant terms cannot be completely disposed of. There, ex there exist examples where this condition is not satisfied for which the theorem does not hold. For instance, let me take p to be y squared plus one. If you evaluate p at integers, then p will always equal to either one or two mod three. And therefore, the set of multiples of three will not contain a configuration of the form x, x plus y squared plus one. That's because every two multiples of three differ by a multiple of three, Whereas every two numbers, whereas every two terms of the configuration x, x plus y squared plus one differ by a number of the form y squared plus one. And as I said, this number is never divisible by three for an integer y. What I have stated on the previous slide was the so-called infinitary version of polynomial summary theorem. That means that it concerns infinite subsets of natural numbers. I will need, however, the finitary version here which, as the name implies, such a, uh, concerns finite subsets of natural numbers. So again, let p1 through pm be distinct integral polynomials. 
then for every alpha between zero and one, there exists some threshold n zero, depending on alpha and the polynomials, such that for all natural numbers n greater than n zero, each subset of one through n of size at least alpha n contains a non-trivial polynomial progression of this form. The reason why I need this finite version is because it implies a finite field version of the polynomial similarity theorem, which says the following. Let P1 through Pm be distinct integral polynomials. Then for each alpha and for each sufficiently large prime, each subset of Fp of size at least alpha P contains a non-trivial polynomial progression of this form. So this is our, uh, the polynomial summary theorem in finite fields. It implies that if a subset of Fp is sufficiently large, then it contains at least one configuration of this form. However, we might inquire more generally about the number of polynomial progressions of this form in a subset A of Fp. And this is our big question for today's talk. Let us first answer it for arithmetic progressions. One of the corollaries of similarity theorem is, is the following statement. Let alpha be greater than zero and let m be a natural number greater than or equal to three. Then there exists some constant depending on alpha and m such that for all primes p and each subset of fp of size alpha at least alpha p, the number of arithmetic progressions of length m in the subset will be at least c times p squared. Let me indicate why p squared is the correct order of magnitude here. An arithmetic progression is determined by two parameters, x, which is its starting point, and y, which is its, its, uh, its, its difference. Both of these parameters span over all of fp, so there are at most p squared choices of what they can be. Uh, and therefore, we have p squared here as opposed to p cubed or, or, or p to the fourth. And so this is what, what the theorem by Varnavides says. Say. Um, we have some lower bounds on, on this quantity, C of alpha M. So for instance, for M equal three, so for three term arithmetic progressions, we have the following bound proved by Bloom and Sisesk. For larger values of M, we also have some estimates for what, what we could take C alpha of M to be. It's natural now to ask, what about more general polynomial progressions? What about progressions that contain a nonlinear term in Y? Uh, and here, the first class of progressions that we should look at are those that come from linearly independent polynomials. And an example here will be an M term sh shifted geometric progression, which is a configuration of the form X, X plus Y, X plus Y squared, X plus Y cubed all the way up to x plus y to the power of m minus one. There is a theorem of Palouse, which says that the number of such configurations in the set A equals alpha to the m times p squared plus an error term of size at most big O of p to two minus c. In particular, uh, we can replace in, in this result the polynomials y, y squared, y cubed, etc by any m minus one linearly independent integral polynomials. And let me also note that once we do this, the absolute constants in the error term will, may change. They, they will depend on the choice of polynomials. And this holds for every, every estimates that I'm giving in this talk. Every constants are allowed to depend on what polynomials we're looking at. In particular, from Pelouse's theorem, we can deduce a bound on the number of sets, or on, on the size of sets lacking uh, shifted geometric progressions. So what this theorem is saying is that all subsets of Fp of size at least omega of p to one minus c contain a polynomial progression of this form. Equivalently, if a subset of Fp lacks a progression of this form, then it will have size at most big O of p to one minus c. The next natural example to look at are arithmetic progressions with higher power differences. And here I've proved the following result, that the number of three term arithmetic progressions in A with square differences is roughly half of the number of all three term arithmetic progressions. 
And this factor one half here does make sense. Note that in, uh, in the finite field FP, we have roughly P over two squares. So we have half as many candidates for what Y squared could be as we have for what Y could be. And therefore this factor one over two here is quite natural. More generally, we can say that the number of M-term arithmetic progressions with k power differences is one over k times the number of M-term arithmetic progressions. And again, the factor one over k here follows from the fact that there are roughly p over k numbers of the form y to the k in FP. A consequence of, of, of this result is that the number of arithmetic progressions with, let's say, square or cubic differences is of the same order of magnitude as the number of all arithmetic progressions. Another configuration that might be of interest is something like this. So here we have a three-term arithmetic progression and an extra nonlinear term of the form x plus y cubed. But what I showed here is that the number of these configurations in A equals the number of three-term arithmetic progressions times the density of A plus an error term. By the density of A, I mean uh, the size of A divided by P. And the same result with, again, possible different values of absolute constants will hold if we replace Y cubed by any polynomial of degree at least three. This is important. We cannot replace it by Y squared, I will show later on why this result would fail with y squared instead of y cubed. So let me give some corollaries of the two results that I've just state, stated. Let A be a subset of FP again. If A contains no progression of the form x, x plus y squared, x plus 2y squared with non-zero y, meaning no three-term arithmetic progression with square difference, then a will have size at most this quantity. And similarly, if A contains no progression of the form x, x plus y, x plus 2y, x plus y cubed, then it will have, again, at most this size. Now, this bound that I gave here has been derived first for sets lacking just three-term arithmetic progressions. This is a result by Blum and Sisask from this year. However, um, using, the, using the estimates for the number of such progressions in subset of finite fields that I gave on the previous few slides, we can infer that the same bound also holds for subsets lacking any of these two configurations. And let me state one more result. Another configuration that might be of interest is something like this. X, X plus Y, X plus Y squared, X plus Y plus Y squared. And here I've showed that the number of these configurations can be related to the number of another linear configuration. A configuration of the form x, x plus y, x plus z, x plus y plus z. And the reason why we have this, um, why we can relate these two counts is because it turns out that y squared here acts sort of independently from y. So it sort of acts like a separate variable. And that's, for, that's, that's why we can replace it by a linear configuration with y squared being replaced by a different variable. Uh, one difference between this result and previous results as well is that the error term here is worse. So the error here, term here is just a qualitative error term of the size little o of p squared, as opposed to the quantitative error term of the size big O of p to 2 minus c that we've seen on previous slides. And this comes from the fact that the methods that I used for this configuration are different from the methods that I used for previous configurations. So let me now spend the rest of the talk discussing how we can prove a result like this. And uh, I'll focus on this one result. So the count of the configuration x, x plus y, x plus 2y, x plus y cubed. First, I want to replace this count by an analytic expression. Um, the expression that you see below is essentially the same thing as above. One over a, sorry, one a here is the indicator function of the set a. Bolded e is the average over fp. So the expression at the top, at the bottom, sorry, is the same thing as the expression at the top divided by p squared. 
this normalization turns out to be useful in, in the way we deal with this, these things. To understand this, this analytic expression at the bottom, it turns out that we need to understand a more general expression of the form given here. Um, this is a multilinear operator, and from now on, I will call operators like this counting operators. So this is a counting operator for the configuration x, x plus y, x plus 2y, x plus y cubed. So I have to understand this counting operator for any choice of functions from fp to c. And for the sake of simplicity, I can assume that these functions are one bounded, meaning that the, in absolute values, they take value at most one. And this is a natural, natural, uh, natural assumption. These functions are defined on a finite set, hence they are all bounded. And so we can always rescale them so that they satisfy this condition. And from now on, I will assume that all the functions that I'm looking at are one bounded. So this is the estimate that we want to show. And it turns out that it follows from the following more general analytic expression. Namely, the counting operator for the configuration x, x plus y, x plus 2y, x plus y cubed can be replaced, can be, can be rewritten as the product of the counting operator for three-term progression times the average of the last function, the function that, that is a weight on x plus y cubed. And this holds up to an error term of the form big O of P2 minus C. And importantly, the error term does not depend on the choice of functions that we take. And let me give you one, one way of, of how to think about this expression. I like to think of this equality as some sort of discorrelation. What it says really is that up to the error term that we have here, the term x plus y cubed occurs independently from the arithmetic progression x, x plus y, x plus 2y. And from now on, I will call results like this discorrelation. This result will also hold if we replace y cubed by any polynomial of degree 3 or, or higher than 3. But it will fail for y squared or other quadratic polynomials. And I will now describe why this is the case, why it fails for these, these polynomials of small degrees. It turns out that to understand these questions, we have to understand algebraic relations between terms of the polynomials that we study. Um, however, we don't look at any algebraic relations. We don't look at the most general uh, form of algebraic relation. We only look at the algebraic relations of the form given on the slide. And so, for instance, the terms of x, x plus y, x plus 2y, x plus y cubed only satisfy a linear relation of this form. And this relation only concerns the first three terms of this progression. It does not involve the fourth term at all. So, in a sense, the fourth term is algebraically independent from the first three terms. Similarly, this will hold if we replace y cubed by any cubic or higher degree polynomial. However, this is no longer the case if we replace y cubed by y squared or any other quadratic polynomial. For y squared, we get this additional relation, which now involves not just the first three terms of the progression, but it also involves the last term of the progression. So in this case, x plus y squared is no longer algebraically independent from the first three terms. And let's see why why we care about this algebraic relation. Why is it a problem for us? So I'll construct examples of functions for which a discorrelation equality would not hold. Let psi be some non-trivial character from fp to c. Uh, an example could be a function of the form e to 2 pi i x over p. And let's now take f1 through f4 to be psi evaluated at the polynomials that appear in the algebraic relation given above. So uh, f1 will just be psi of t squared plus t 2t, because if we substitute x for t, then we get the first term in the algebraic relation above. f2 of t will just be psi of minus 2t squared, because if we substitute x plus y for t, then we get the second term that appears above. f3 of t will be psi of t squared, because if we replace t by x plus 2y, then we get the third term in the algebraic relation above. And finally, 
f4 of t will be psi of minus 2t because if we substitute x plus y squared for t, then we get the last term in the algebraic relation above. Um, psi is a multiplicative function. Therefore, if we take the product of f1 through f4 evaluated at the terms of the progression, then this is the same as psi of the algebraic relation given above. And since this algebraic relation sums up to zero, then what we get here is psi of zero, which is just one. And therefore, the counting operator for this choice of functions will just be one. However, if we look at the product of the counting operator for the three-term arithmetic progression times the average of f4, then we get zero. And this is because the average of f4 is just the average of psi over fp, and the average of any non-trivial character is just zero. And therefore, because these two expressions differ so drastically, we cannot hope for a discorrelation result to occur here. So this correlation fails for this configuration, and it fails because we have an algebraic relation that connects all the four, all the four terms of the progression. So what it shows to us is that algebraic relations of this form form a sort of abstractions. And it turns out that these are the only abstractions. Um, the discorrelation equality, however, holds for a more general family of, of, of progressions. So for instance, it will hold for, a, for all progressions of this form. This is a union of an M-term arithmetic progression and these nonlinear terms, um, x plus y to the m, x plus y to m plus one, etc. It's important here that the smallest power is m. If we replaced y to the m by y, y to the m minus one, this would not hold because we would have a non-trivial algebraic relation con connecting this term with the terms of the algebraic, uh, with the terms of the arithmetic progression before. So for a progression like this, we obtain again a, a discorrelation equality of this form. So what this equality is telling us is that the counting operator for the configuration given above is just the product of the counting operator for the M-term arithmetic progression and the product of averages of the functions that are weights on the nonlinear terms of the progression. And this equa equality holds up to a narrow term of the form big O of P2 minus C. So this is the end of the main part of the talk. I just now want to spend a few minutes discussing some of the questions that you might possibly have. So the first question that you might have is whether the results that I presented generalize to FQ where Q is now a prime power, not necessarily a prime. And here the answer is mixed. For some results, the, the, the techniques that I'm using allow perfectly to, to extend to, 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 to write down the answers for FQ. So the, for these particular configurations, uh, the same results hold for FQ. However, for some other configurations, my methods only are, allow me to prove results over FP. So for instance, for the configuration x, x plus y, x plus y squared, x plus y plus y squared, the result that I gave about this configuration is only valid for FP. Now, I do not see a reason for it to fail over FQ, where Q would be a prime power. It's just that my methods do not allow me to, to prove it over FQ. Another question that you might have is, how do you prove a discorrelation equality for configurations like this? And um, the answer is that I'm using a mix of techniques. I'm relying very heavily on discrete Fourier analysis. I'm also using, using the cauchy schwarz inequality quite a lot. I'm using probabilistic techniques like pigeonhole principle or popularity principle. And I am using a basic theory of Gower's norms. And finally, you might also inquire more about the error terms. For some configurations, I had a quantitative error terms of the form big O of P2, 2 minus C or P2 minus C. Whereas for other configurations, I had to do with qualitative error terms of the size little O of P squared. So why is that? And the answer is that for different configurations, I'm using different methods. Uh, unfortunately for configurations like X, X plus Y, X plus Y squared, X plus Y plus Y squared, I have to re resort to results from higher order Fourier analysis, 
And these results are qualitative, meaning they don't give quantitative error term, they just give a qualitative error term. And therefore, in my results, I have qualitative error term. This is the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me via my email address, which is given here. If you also want to read more about the subject, you can have a look at some of the papers that I'm attaching here. Thank you very much.